It's March the 27th. Let's read the Bible. Friends, welcome back to this year-long adventure from Genesis to Revelation in just one year. Here we are at the end of March. We have come to Joshua chapter 10. I want to say welcome to those of you who are joining us new today or this week. And just a reminder that you can find all the previous videos. They are archived at keepbelieving.com, on the Rumble video platform, on YouTube, and also on Facebook. So glad to have you with us. Now, let me remind you of the outline of the book of Joshua. Taking, settling, keeping. Taking the land, chapters 1 through 12. Settling the land, chapters 13 through 22. And then keeping the land, chapters 23 and 24. Taking the land, the key word is fight. Settling the land, the key word is move. Keeping the land, and the key word there is obey. The people of God, in order to do God's will, they got to fight, they got to move, and they must obey. We've come today to the last three chapters of the first section of this book. We've already covered some of the better known stories, the crossing of the Jordan River, the, the, the epical victory, the great battle where Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down, the strange, sad story of Achan, the conquest of Ai, and then that very strange story in Joshua chapter 9. We talked about it yesterday, the Gibeonite deception. So now we come in chapter 10 to, I think, the last story in this book that is very well known, the story of the day the sun stood still. Joshua 10. Now King Adonah Zedek of Jerusalem heard that Joshua had conquered Ai and completely destroyed it, treating Ai and its king as he had Jericho and its king, and that the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were living among them. So Adonah Zedek and his people were greatly alarmed because Gibeon was a large city, like one of the royal cities. It was larger than Ai, and all its men were warriors. Therefore, King Adonah Zedek of Jerusalem sent word to King Hoham of Hebron, King Piram of Jarmuth, King Japhia of Lachish, and King Deber of Eglon, saying, Come up and help me. We will attack Gibeon, because they have made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. So, the five Amorite kings, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon, joined forces, advanced with all their armies, besieged Gibeon, and fought against it. Then the men of Gibeon sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal, Don't give up on your servants. Come quickly and save us. Help us. For all the Amorite kings living in the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua and all his troops, including all his best soldiers, came from Gilgal. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them, for I have handed them over to you. Not one of them will be able to stand against you. So Joshua caught them by surprise after marching all night from Gilgal. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel. He defeated them in a great slaughter at Gibeon, chased them through the ascent of Beth Horon, and struck them down as far as Azekah and Machidah. As they fled before Israel, the Lord threw large hailstones on them from the sky along the descent of Beth Horon all the way to Azekah, and they died. More of them died from the hail than the Israelites killed with the sword. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to the Israelites, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the presence of Israel. Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and moon over the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on its enemies. Isn't this written in the book of Jashar? So the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed its setting almost a full day. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord listened to a man because the Lord fought for Israel. Then Joshua and all Israel with him returned to the camp at Gilgal. Now, the five defeated kings had fled and hidden in the cave at Makeda. It was reported to Joshua, the five kings have been found. They are hiding in the cave at Makeda. Joshua said, roll large stones against the mouth of the cave and station men by it to guard the kings. But as for the rest of you, don't stay there. Pursue your enemies and attack them from behind. Don't let them enter their cities, for the Lord your God has handed them over to you. So 
Joshua and the Israelites finished inflicting a terrible slaughter on them until they were destroyed. Although a few survivors ran away to the fortified cities, the people returned safely to Joshua in the camp at Makeda, and no one dared to threaten the Israelites. Then Joshua said, open the mouth of the cave and bring those five kings to me out of there. That is what they did. They brought the five kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, Eglon to Joshua out of the cave. When they had brought the kings to him, Joshua summoned all the men of Israel and said to the military commanders who had accompanied him, come here and put your feet on the necks of of these kings. So the commanders came forward and put their feet on their necks. Joshua said to them, do not be afraid or discouraged. Be strong and courageous for the Lord will do this to all the enemies you fight. After this, Joshua struck them down and executed them. He hung their bodies on five trees, and they were there until evening. At sunset, Joshua commanded that they be taken down from the trees and thrown into the cave where they had hidden. Then large stones were placed against the mouth of the cave, and the stones are still there today. On that day, Joshua captured Makeda and struck it down with the sword, including its king. He completely destroyed it and everyone in it, leaving no survivors. So he treated the king of Makeda as he had the king of Jericho. Joshua and all Israel with him crossed from Makeda to Libna and fought against Libna. The Lord also handed it and its king over to Israel. He struck it down, putting everyone in it to the sword and left no survivors in it. He treated Libna's king as he had the king of Jericho. From Libna, Joshua and all Israel with him crossed to Lachish. They laid siege to it and attacked it. The Lord handed Lachish over to Israel, and Joshua captured it on the second day. He struck it down, putting everyone in it to the sword, just as he had done to Libna. At that time, King Horam of Gezer went to help Lachish, but Joshua struck him down along with his people, leaving no survivors. Then Joshua crossed from Lachish to Eglon and all Israel with him. They laid siege to it and attacked it. On that day, they captured it and struck it down putting everyone in it to the sword. He completely destroyed it that day, just as he had done to Lachish. Next, Joshua and all Israel with him went up from Eglon to Hebron, that was up in the mountains, literally up into the mountains to Hebron, and attacked it. They captured it and struck down its king, all its villages, everyone in it with the sword. He left no survivors, just as he had done at Eglon. He completely destroyed Hebron and everyone in it. Finally, Joshua turned toward Debir, and attacked it, and all Israel was with him. He captured it, its king, and all its villages. They struck them down with the sword and completely destroyed everyone in it, leaving no survivors. He treated Debir and its king as he had treated Hebron, and as he had treated Libna and its king. So Joshua conquered the whole region, the hill country, the Negev, the Judean foothills, and the slopes, with all their kings, leaving no survivors. He completely destroyed every living being as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. Joshua conquered everyone from Kadesh Barnea to Gaza and all the land of Goshen as far as Gibeon. Joshua captured all these kings and their land in one campaign because the Lord, the God of Israel, fought for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. So what you have in that chapter, you have the conquest of of the central cities, the story of about the hailstones and the the sun standing still. That's a focus on just one battle. But after that battle uh, in the central and southern region, Joshua went from victory to victory to victory. Now, in chapter 11, you've got the conquest of the northern cities. When King Jabin of Hatzor heard this news, he sent a message to King Jobab of Madon, the kings of Shemron and Akshaph, and the kings of the north and the hill country, the Arab is south of Chinnereth, the Judean foothills, and the slopes of Dor to the west, the Canaanites in the east and west, the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, and Jebusites in the hill country, and the Hivites at the foot of Hermon in the land of Mizpah. They went out with all their armies, a multitude as numerous as the sand on the seashore, along with a vast number of horses and chariots. All these kings joined forces. They came and camped together at the waters of Merom to attack Israel. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them, for at this time tomorrow I will cause all of them to be killed before Israel. You are to hamstring their horses and burn their chariots. So Joshua and all his troops 
sur surprised them at the waters of Miram and attacked them. The Lord handed them over to Israel and they struck them down, pursuing them as far as greater Sidon and Misrephoth Maim, and to the east as far as the valley of Mizpah. They struck them down, leaving no survivors. Joshua treated them as the Lord had told him. He hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots. At that time, Joshua turned back, captured Hatzor, and struck down its king with a sword, because Hatzor had formerly been the leader of all these kingdoms. They struck down everyone in it with a sword, completely destroying them. He left no one alive. Then he burned Hatzor. Joshua captured all these kings and their cities, and struck them down with the sword. He completely destroyed them as Moses, the Lord's servant, had commanded. However, Israel did not burn any of the cities that stood on their mounds except Hatzor, which Joshua burned. The Israelites burned, plundered all their spoils and cattle of these cities for themselves, but they struck down every person with the sword until they had annihilated them, leaving no one alive. Just as the Lord had commanded his servant Moses, Moses commanded Joshua. That is what Joshua did leaving nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Moses. So Joshua took all this land. He's talking about the land of the north, the hill country, all the Negev, all the land of Goshen, the foothills, the Arabah, and the hill country of Israel with its foothills from Mount Halak, which ascends to Seir as far as Baalgad in the valley of Lebanon at the foot of Mount Hermon. He captured all their kings and struck them down, putting them to death. Joshua waged war with all these kings for a long time. No city made peace with the Israelites except the Hivites who inhabited Gibeon. That's the story we talked about in Joshua chapter 9. All of them, all of them were taken in battle, for it was the Lord's intention to harden their hearts so that they would engage Israel in battle, be completely destroyed without mercy, and be annihilated just as the Lord had commanded Moses. At that time, Joshua proceeded to exterminate the Anakim from the hill country, Hebron, Debir, and Anab, all the hill country of Judah and of Israel. Joshua completely destroyed them with their cities. No Anakim were left in the land of the Israelites, except for some remaining in Gazagath and Ashdod. So Joshua took the entire land in keeping with all the Lord had told Moses. Joshua then gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal allotments. After this, the land had rest from war. Took about seven years. When you read this, you read it quickly, you think, well, it's a couple of weekends. No, this is a long series of battles. Central campaign, southern campaign, northern campaign, all of this. Many, many battles. Much fighting. Much dying. About seven years. So now, Chapter 12 is a summary. This is the end of the settlement or, or the, 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 um, the taking section of the book. Chapters 1 through 12, taking the land. Chapter 12 now, just a summary statement of the first 11 chapters. What's happened? The Israelites struck down the following kings of the land and took possession of their land beyond the Jordan to the east and from the Arnon River to Mount Hermon, including the Arab eastward. King Sihon of the Amorites lived in Heshbon. He ruled from Ero Er, from the rim of the Arnon River, along the middle of the valley, and half of Gilead up to the Jabbok River, the border of the Ammonites. The Arab east of the Sea of Chenereth to the Sea of Arabah, that is the Dead Sea, eastward through Beth Jeshemoth, and southward below the slopes of Pisgah. King Og of Bashan, of the remnant of the Rephaim lived in Ashtaroth and Edrai. He ruled over Mount Hermon, Salika, Albation, up to the Geshurite and Maakathite border, and half of Gilead to the border of King Sihon of Heshbon. Moses, the Lord's servant, and the Israelites struck them down. And Moses, the Lord's servant, gave their land as an inheritance to the Reubenites, Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh. Let me just stop right here and say what we have in these first six verses of Joshua 12. We've already read about this in the book of Deuteronomy. These were the two kings, uh, King Og and King Sihon, east of the Jordan River, who were conquered in the days of Moses. Moses did this before he died. And he gave this land to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh. So two kings east of the Jordan have been defeated. Now we read on. Verse 7, Joshua and the Israelites 
struck down the following kings of the land beyond the Jordan to the west, from Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon, that's north to Mount Halak, which ascends towards Seir. Joshua gave their land as an inheritance to the tribes of Israel according to their allotments, the hill country, the Judean foothills, the Arabah, the slopes, the wilderness, and the Negev, the land of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Here comes the list. The king of Jericho, one. The king of Ai, which is next to Bethel, one. The king of Jerusalem, one. The king of Hebron, one. The king of Jarmuth, one. The king of Lachish, one. The king of Eglon, one. The king of Gezer, one. The king of Debir, one. The king of Geter, one. The king of Hormah, one. The king of Arid, one. The king of Libna, one. The king of Adullam, one. The king of Machida, one. The king of Bethel, one. The king of Tapua, one. The king of Hefer, one. The king of Aphek, one. The king of Lasharon, one. The king of Madon, one. The king of Hatzor, one. The king of Shimron, Miron, one. The king of Oxap, one. The king, the king of Ta'anak, one. The king of Megiddo, one. The king of Kedesh, one. The king of Jachniam in Carmel, one. The king of Dor in Napheth, Dor, one. The king of Goim, Goim in Gilgal, one. The king of Tirzah, one. The total number of all kings, 31. That's 31 kings Joshua defeated to the west of the Jordan River. And there were two kings to the east of the Jordan River. Moses defeated. And two plus 31 means there were 33 kings in all who were defeated by the hand of God under Moses and Joshua. And you may say, what is the importance of this? Well, let me tell you, if you're a Jew, you're an Israelite. And it's generations later. This is a reminder. This is what God did. Yes, they had to fight, but it was God who gave them strength. By the way, did you, did you notice that little verse I tried to emphasize? The Lord even stirred up the Canaanites to fight against the Israelites because he intended there to be a battle and he intended to give the land through conquest to his chosen people. All of it is ultimately under God's control Victory belongs to the Lord. The Lord keeps his promises. Go out, folks. Have a great and amazing day. And keep in mind that the battles you're going through, victory belongs to the Lord. Trust in him. Follow him. Give him glory. Stand and fight. Friends, the Lord is on your side. Have a great God-blessed day. Come back tomorrow. We'll do this again.